Let us, let us pray together. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath and this opportunity that we have to, to rest in the assurance that we can't make ourselves holy. It is God who makes us holy. We want to rest in that reality today. Bless us as we open your word. May you speak to us, for we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Today I want to reference back to an illustration that I used last Sabbath to try to show us the challenge that we have in biblical interpretation. For those of you that were here last Sabbath, here it is. I write an email to the Hillside O'Malley Church in 2019, and the email says, we are having haystacks for lunch this Sabbath, and if you're joining us and a guest and you're not a part of our community of faith, welcome. Just if you know, want to know, Haystacks is a glorified taco salad. And that's uniquely known within Adventist circles. So we are having Haystacks for lunch this Sabbath. And the community of faith understands what I mean when I say that. Go forward 2,000 years. If you imagine life lasts that long and there's still human life on planet Earth, a researcher in 4019, imagine what life would be like then. 4019 is going through the digital archives and comes across this email from an obscure preacher in Southern Anchorage that says we are having haystacks for lunch this Sabbath. There's a lot of room for misinterpretation. I remember one member came to me after church and said, uh, this researcher could have come to the conclusion that we study the book of Daniel, don't we? And Nebuchadnezzar ate grass for seven years. And so this group ate straw for church on Sabbath, stacks of straw. And you can see that there is this hermeneutical interpretive challenge in going back 2,000 years and trying to understand what I meant when I said we are having haystacks for lunch this Sabbath. Now we go to the challenge that we have in interpreting Paul's letters. Paul wrote epistles, occasional letters to the believers in Corinth, and this is known as Corinthians, or the believers in Ephesus, known as Ephesians. He also wrote personal letters to Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and they're preserved for us today. And we need to go through this process of understanding what it meant first so that we can understand what it means today. It's first God's word to them and then it is God's word to us. And so if we go to understanding what it means today without understanding what it meant, let's take an example of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. The Bible says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now if a person takes this and goes through the interpretive process of trying to understand what it means today without understanding what it meant in the first century, and decides on a Sabbath morning to follow Paul's exhortation to greet everyone with a holy kiss. It's going to be a lot of people that come in the front door that's in for a surprise. Isn't that right? Like, what are you doing? Well, Paul said to greet one another with a holy kiss. Well, if you go back to try to understand what it meant then, it was a form of greeting back then. And so the principle would be that we are to engage each other and greet each other in a holy way. And so the modern equivalent today would be to greet each other with a holy hug. It needs to be holy, amen? Holy hug or a holy handshake. And so that would be the equivalent. We need to go through this process. Now, this seems rather innocuous, but there is a passage, and this is the focus of our study today, that has been quite problematic for Seventh-day Adventists, Sabbath keepers, those that uphold the Seventh-day Sabbath. It's Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. And this is the only reference in the theological section of the New Testament to the Sabbath. Here it is, Colossians 2, 16. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. Now, before we go into our study to understanding what it meant and then understanding what it means, 
I want to read to you some of our evangelical scholars commenting on what they think this means, and I'm going to go through them very quickly here. This is from Anthony Buzzard. The New Testament witness in Colossians 2.16 is powerfully against the obligation of Sabbath keeping. This is from Larry Halfley. One can understand why Colossians 2.16 is the only one of those references that says the Sabbath is not binding. He concludes that Seventh-day Adventists, us, are condemned by the text of Colossians 2.14-16. R.A. Torrey, commenting on Colossians 2.16, says this passage is a death blow to all sects who observe the seventh-day Sabbath. H.M. Riggle, here is a clear positive statement that the Sabbath taken out of the way, nailing it to the cross, and therefore no one has a right to judge us for its non-observance. This single declaration of Paul's refutes all the theories of Sabbatarians. And here is Walter Martin, the renowned Walter Martin from Questions on Doctrine. Regarding Colossians 2.16, he says, In light of this scripture alone, I contend that the argument for Sabbath observance collapses. Wow, so here we are. Now, please don't leave at this point. Stay with me, all right? Don't be like, oh, we're only... Um, but uh, this shows us there are different interpretations of Colossians 2.16. Now, let's look at it in your own Bible. I didn't put it on the screen because I wanted you to read it in your own Bible. And let's read a few verses before and a few verses after and get a little bit of the literary context of what Paul is saying here. Let's pick it up in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off of the body the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ." buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith and working of God who raised him from the dead and you being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh he has made alive together with him having forgiven all your trespasses having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us which was contrary to us he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and power, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. So, or therefore, let no one judge you in food, in drink, regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ." You'll notice that Paul begins his argument by saying, you have been circumcised spiritually through baptism. So you have no need of physical circumcision. And then he proceeds with his argument. Now, an important thing to do in understanding any letter, because this was written to the church in Colossae, remember it's first God's word to them, then it is God's word to us, and it's like listening to one half of a conversation. You're writing, he's writing a letter to a specific group, a community of faith in the first century, and he's writing for specific reasons. And we can put together the historical context of the early church and some of the issues that they faced. And this is an important thing to do when you read any of Paul's letters, is to put it against the backdrop and the narrative of the book of Acts, because it tells you the circumstances that arose in the inception of the early church. As we noted in an earlier presentation, the early church in Acts chapter 2 was 99% Jewish. I would say for all intents and purposes, 100% Jews. Those people that came to Pentecost were making a pilgrimage from all parts of the world. They were Jewish 
They were there for the day of Pentecost, and the reason why the tongues were so important is because every Jew heard their language from the region in which they came. And so they had this mass baptism. Can you imagine? The church goes from 120 to 3,000 in one day, and every one of those, now there may be, have been a Gentile that slipped in there, but I don't think so. It was probably all Jewish. Okay, so 3,000 Jews become Christians in one day, and the church experiences exponential growth. All of these Christians were circumcised. All of these Christians kept the Jewish holidays and feasts. They were very familiar with the law of Moses. And what happened after that, because of Paul, the church began a radical demographic transition in which Gentiles began to come into the church and the scales began to tip anytime you have an ethnic homogenous group and then other people start coming in. It's okay as long as the, they're the minority, but once the tip of scales of ethnic population began to tip in a certain favor, there are problems that arise. And so in Acts chapter 15, you can see that the Jewish Christians had a problem with the Gentile Christians. And here it is, Acts chapter 15, verse 1 and 5. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are what? This is a radical teaching. These are Jewish Christians. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be what? You can't be saved. These are Jewish Christians going to the Gentile Christians saying, look, unless you go through a surgical procedure, you're not going to make it into heaven. That's, her that's heresy. Heresy. And this was a huge issue in the early church. The Jewish Christians looked at the Gentile Christians and said, look, you're not the real thing. You need to prove your fidelity. Baptism's not enough. You need to be circumcised. Paul and Barnabas stood up and said, that's wrong. Huge issue took place in the church. Verse 5 says, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, Pharisees became Christians, but they held on to some of their early presuppositions. They stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Huge issue in the early church. And so Paul began writing letters as he was raising churches up in Gentiles in Gentile churches in Asia Minor, the, these churches were coming up and there was this constant push by certain Jewish Christians to hold the line of circumcision in the law of Moses. And you can see this in his letter to the Galatians. He says, it doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. Why is he writing that? Because of the context of the early church. It doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is that we have been transformed into a new creation. Now, this was not only a lay issue, but it became a leadership issue as well. As two of the most prominent apostles in the first century, Paul and Peter, went head to head. Here it is, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face. Confrontation. For what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterwards, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of the criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. And even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter, in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile. What did he mean? He was saying, look, you don't hold yourself to the Mosaic laws and rituals anymore. Why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? It was not only a lay issue, it became a leadership issue, and this was a central point of contention in the early church as the demographics went from a Jewish population to a Gentile population at the heart of the matter was 
circumcision and the law of Moses. This is an important historical context for us to understand Colossians because Colossians was not written in a vacuum. There was a context to it. And like I said, it's like you're listening to one half of the conversation. You don't know all of the circumstances, but when you read the Bible and the book of Acts, you can put together a biblical reconstruction of the issues that are taking place. They were not struggling with whether or not to keep the seventh day holy. They were struggling with how to apply Moses' law and specifically circumcision. Now, the point that comes up here is the word sh Sabbath in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. So let no one judge you in food or drink regarding festival, new moon, or Sabbaths. When you look at the context of Colossians 2, this is specifically in relationship to Judy, uh, Judaism and Jewish tradition and Mosaic law. Mind you, the New Testament had not been written yet. It was being written at this time. And let's examine the word Sabbath. When you look in the Old Testament and analyze the Hebrew Bible, the word Shabbat occurs 111 times in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. This was all they had in the first century. Their scriptures were the Old Testament. So when they were referred to the word Sabbath, the Sabbath had specific connotations and implications. So 111 times in the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew word Shabbat occurs. In 94 cases, out of the 111 times, it refers to the seventh-day Sabbath. Now, how we come to a conclusion as to which Sabbath it is, because I'll go into detail as to the other Sabbaths that the word Shabbat can refer to, is there are certain contextual markers. And many times, there are markers such as the article the, the Sabbath in the Hebrew, or my Sabbath. So when the Bible talks about the seventh-day Sabbath, the article the is used, and also my. God says it is my Sabbath. Let me give you a couple examples of this. At the heart of the Ten Commandments, written in stone by the finger of God, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. This is a marker that comes up repeatedly when you study the 94 cases out of the 111 in which the word Sabbath is used. Also, in Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, you see the, the possessive pronoun, my. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between you, me and you, throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you or makes you holy. So in review, out of the 111 cases, 94 of them refer to the Seventh-day Sabbath, and many times there are contextual markers that give us a clue as to which day it is, the Seventh-day Sabbath, and the, the, the word, the article, the is used, or the possessive pronoun, my, is used. Now, out of the 111 cases, 17 times the Hebrew word Shabbat is used, to reference something else. Not the seventh-day Sabbath, but it can also refer to sabbatical weeks. This is found in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15. The weeks between the wave sheep offering and the day of Pentecost were known as sabbatical weeks. The day of atonement, the seventh day of the tenth month in the fall, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 32, was known as a Sabbath as well. And then you had years of jubilee. These were known as sabbatical years. This is in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 64. It's interesting when you do a study of these 17 verses in which the word Shabbat refers to something other than the seventh-day Sabbath, that it's prefaced by the word its Sabbath or your Sabbath or her Sabbath. Now, remember when we talked about the seventh-day Sabbath, it's referred to as the Sabbath in the Hebrew, or my Sabbath. But in these 17 cases, is referred to 
a ceremonial Sabbath, which is given an indication, a marker, its Sabbath, your Sabbath, or her Sabbath. And I want to point these out. This is the sabbatical years, the year of Jubilee, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 34. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbath. See the difference? The seventh day Sabbath is my Sabbath, God's Sabbath, or the Sabbath. But the year of Jubilee, in which the land rests, is referred to as its Sabbath, as long as it lines desolate, you are to you and your enemies land, then the land shall enjoy its rest and its Sabbath. Now, here is the reference to the Day of Atonement, the seventh day of the tenth month. It can fall on the first, second, third, any day of the week, but it was to be a Sabbath's rest. Once a year, the Day of Atonement, it was a Sabbath's rest. And notice the word that is used before the word Sabbath. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month. From evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. You see the difference here. God's seventh-day Sabbath is my Sabbath, or the Sabbath, but the Day of Atonement is your Sabbath. The year of Jubilee is its Sabbath. And here it is in Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 21 to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So this is the sabbatical that the land of Israel took during the seven years of captivity under the Babylonians. Now in review, in 17 out of the 111 times, it refers to something other than the seventh-day Sabbath, and there are certain contextual markers. It's referred to as its Sabbath, her Sabbath, or your Sabbath. And this is the summary I give here on the screen. And the question is, which one is Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 referring to? Is it God's Sabbath, my Sabbath, the Sabbath, or is it your Sabbath? And this is important for us to consider because Colossians chapter 2 was not written in a vacuum, it was written to a specific situation, a specific circumstance. And so my point simply is this. When we read the word Sabbath in Colossians 2, we can't automatically assume that this is the seventh-day Sabbath because a study, an exhaustive study of the Old Testament reveals that not every time the word Sabbath is referred to is the seventh-day Sabbath, it can refer to a ceremonial Sabbath, an annual Sabbath, a weekly Sabbath, or a Sabbath rest on the Day of Atonement. Now, it's interesting because in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, there are th there's a triad that emerges here that Paul used. He says, so let no one judge you in food, drink, or in festival, or new moon, or Sabbaths. He lists these three in a specific order, festival, new moon, or Sabbaths. Now, let me touch on the new moon. This one is not in controversy at all. Every month, with the, with the change of the moon, with the new moon that emerges, there was a burnt offering and sacrifices that took place once a month in the Jewish calendar. It was the festival of the new moon. Now, the term festival here is a unique term and in order to understand this, you have to look at the book of Exodus to understand specifically, in a narrow sense, the way that festival was used in the Hebrew mind. And you find it here in Exodus chapter 24, verses 14 through 16. Three times a year, you are to celebrate a what? A festival to me. So in the Jewish calendar, these were three feasts, three festivals that were separated from the rest. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread, Passover. Celebrate the festival of harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in the field, the first fruits. Celebrate the festival of ingathering, tabernacles, at the end of the year when you gather in your crops from the field. Three times a year, all the men are to appear before the sovereign Lord. These were unique feasts. They were a joyous celebration, and they were the three feasts in the Jewish calendar that every male in Israel was required to make a pilgrimage to the temple. These were different than all the rest. This was different than the Day of Atonement. This was a joyous occasion that all males in Israel had to make a pilgrimage to the temple, in this case, Jerusalem. And this is 
a scholar, New International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis that backs up Exodus chapter 25. It says, the term festival, Hog, is used to refer to three annual Israelite festivals, the Feast of Booths, Passover, Unleavened Bread, and Feast of First Fruits. They're required making a pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem. Now, you may be wondering, oh, what's the big deal in regards to these festival and feasts? The point is, when the, word, when the term festival is used from a Jewish perspective, it referred in a narrow sense to three of the annual festivals. It did not refer to the Day of Atonement. These were celebratory feasts. And so when, when Paul says festival, and when you cross-reference it with the Old Testament, he could be, and I believe, very specifically referring to these three Jewish re fees referred to in the book of Exodus. Now, in summary, the term festival refers to three joyous celebratory pilgrimage feasts in Jerusalem or in the Jewish annual calendar, festival of unleavened bread, Passover, festival of ingathering, which was first fruits, festival of harvest, which was booths. Note the term festival did not refer to the day of atonement, which was considered a Sabbath of self-examination and afflicting your soul in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 32. Now, it's interesting because when you look at Paul's writings, he paraphrased much of the Old Testament, but he specifically, like in the book of Romans, quotes from the book of Hosea. Now, when you look at Hosea chapter 2, verse 11, it's interesting because Hosea says, I will stop all her celebrations, referring to Israel. In other words, there will come a day in which all of the festivals and feasts will come to an end. And notice what he says after that. There's going to come a day when all the festivals come to an end. And notice the order that Hosea lists the festivals. Here they are. Her yearly festivals, her new moon, and her Sabbath days, all her appointed feasts, festivals. Now, we noted in an earlier slide that there was a distinction between her Sabbaths and my Sabbaths. Remember that? And so, judging by an exhaustive study of the way the Shabbat was used in the Old Testament, you can know that here Hosea is not referring to the seventh-day Sabbath. He's referring to the ceremonial Sabbath, her Sabbath. He didn't say my Sabbath or the Sabbath. He said her Sabbath. So it's interesting because right here, Hosea gives a list in order, surprisingly similar, I'd say identical to Colossians 2, of festivals, new moons, and her Sabbath days. Now, what emerges here is what they call an inverted parallelism, a form of Hebrew writing, chiastic structure. It says, I will stop all her celebrations, her yearly festivals, annual pilgrimage feasts, the three that we noted, her new moons, the monthly feasts, her Sabbath days, which were the annual ceremonial Sabbaths. This was a form of Hebrew writing. And there's other examples in the book of Hosea where he does an inverted parallelism. So, so here Hosea goes annual, monthly, annual. Inverted parallelism. parallelism. Her yearly festivals, annual pilgrimage feasts, her new moon, monthly feasts, her Sabbath days, annual ceremonial Sabbaths. You cannot deny from a reading of Hosea chapter 2, verse 11, that he's referring specifically to ceremonial Sabbaths. And he goes in a chiastic structure, annual, monthly, annual. This is the way the Hebrew mind worked, in parallelism. Now, Paul was a Jew. He was a theologically trained Jew that quoted from the book of Hosea, specifically in the book of Romans. So he was familiar with this book. I want you to notice the uncanny similarity to Colossians 2. Here it is. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Hosea chapter 2, there will come a day when all the festivals and feasts will cease. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, so let no one judge you in food, drink, regarding festival, new moon, or Sabbath. Exact same order 
as Hosea chapter 2. Festival, new moon, or Sabbaths. Now, some people may say, how do you know that Paul used inverted parallelism like the Hebrews did in the Old Testament? Because he used it in his writing specifically in the same chapter of Colossians 2. Here's another example. Just a few verses later, Paul uses inverted parallelism here. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. Handle, touch. Some translations say do not touch, do not taste, do not touch. Okay, so this is inverted parallelism where he parallels the first part with the last part with a middle in between. And here, the biblical evidence supports this reality that Paul in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 through 16 is not talking about the seventh day Sabbath, but he's talking about her Sabbath, a ceremonial Sabbath. He's using inverted parallelism here, a festival or new moon, or Sabbaths. A festival, the annual pilgrimage feast, or new moon, the monthly feast, or Sabbaths, the annual Sabbaths. In other words, because of Jesus, we don't have to keep the festivals, feasts, or Sabbath days anymore. And in the context of the book of Acts, this makes perfect sense. Now, there's another term here that gives away what Paul is talking about, and it's in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, so let no one judge you in food, drink, regarding festival or new moon or Sabbath. The term against us is a direct quote from Deuteronomy chapter 31. Here it is, Deuteronomy chapter 31. Take this book of the law, and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. Paul says the requirements that was against the people was nailed to the cross, and in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 26, it says the law of Moses was against the people. A direct quote of Deuteronomy chapter 31. What was against the people? The law of Moses. And then he says, let no one judge you in food, drink, Sabbath, days, and so forth, the ceremonial Sabbath. Now, it's interesting. This is a photograph from Messiah's mansion, which came a few weeks ago. And look at this replica of the Ark of the Covenant. You remember in Deuteronomy chapter 31, 26, it said that the law of Moses was placed where? beside the Ark of the Covenant. And look at this replica here on the screen. You'll notice behind me that is a, a replica of the scroll, the Law of Moses, and notice its location. It is placed at the side of the Ark, beside the Ark. Notice what's inside the Ark, the Ten Commandments. And what is the Ten Commandments written on? Stone. What is Moses' law written on? It's a scroll. The difference in material is notable, and also, where is the location of the seventh-day Sabbath, the Sabbath, my Sabbath, as in God's Sabbath? Is it on paper or is it on stone? It's on stone, inside the ark. Where are the ceremonial Sabbaths? On the paper. This distinction we cannot overlook. Which was of a passing nature and was against the people? It was Moses' law. And what was the controversy in the early church? It was about circumcision and Moses' law. So let no one judge you in food, drink, festival, the annual pilgrimage feast, new moon, the monthly feast, or Sabbaths, annual Sabbaths, such as the Day of Atonement. And the Bible goes on, verse 17, Paul writes, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Now, this is not indicating that the law of Moses casts a shadow, but notice the whole term. It says, a shadow of things to come. In the original, this is literally foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is an indication of future events, and that's exactly what the annual ceremonies and feasts did. So Passover foreshadowed the crucifixion. The unleavened bread foreshadowed Christ in the grave. 
the first fruits, the resurrection. You can go down through the annual feast. Jesus has fulfilled, is fulfilling, or will fulfill them all. Every one of the annual feasts is a foreshadowing of what Jesus has done, is doing, and will do. And Paul says, look, we don't have to keep these annual festivals and feasts anymore. The substance is of Christ. They are a foreshadowing. Praise the Lord that three times a year we don't have to get a flight to Jerusalem. Amen? Amen. That's expensive, especially from Alaska. You know? And to, to go all the way over there for this annual pilgrimage, Paul says, look, that's been nailed to the cross. We don't have to keep those anymore. They were a handwriting of ordinances that was against the people. Now, I want to close with this illustration because some people may be like, hey, what's the practical application? And here is a, a photograph of a sculpture of Aristotle, one of the most renowned and seminal philosophers in Greek thinking. Aristotle, 300 years before the time of Christ, maybe you've heard this illustration before, noted that a spider is an insect with six legs. And for 2,000 years, no one bothered to count. Spiders are accessible to everyone, not just Aristotle. 2,000 years. Now think about the implications of that. 2,000 years from 300 B.C. all the way up to the year 1700, the 1700s, where a gentleman by the name of Lamarck had the audacity to check Aristotle. <laughs> Here's a spider. Let me count, and let's do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <gasps> Can you imagine that? Aristotle was wrong. The point is this. Let no authority or scholar be a replacement for your own personal examination of Scripture. Amen? Amen. Yes. Just like we have access to spiders, we have an access to the Word of God. Yes. Right? Yes. Examine for yourself. Don't trust me. Amen. Amen. Uh, you won't hear me say that very much. But anyway, yeah, I, what I mean is, don't take my word for it. I could be leading you all astray. Go examine for yourselves. And here it is. Be a Berean. Examine the Bible for yourself. This is, this is a remarkable text. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Now the Berean Jews were more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness. Now who are they receiving this from? Paul. If Paul gives you a Bible study, that's pretty weighty. That's pretty compelling. I would be inclined to say, oh, I don't need to check that out. I mean, come on, Paul. Just, just, just bring it on. Just tell me more. But, but these Bereans had the audacity. They heard it from Paul, and then they went back to the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And Paul says, look, these are more noble. This is the Protestant heritage, the biblical heritage that we all have. Don't take any person's authority above your own personal examination of Scripture. Amen? Let us go to the Word of God for ourselves and study if these things are so. I want to challenge you, whether it's this topic or any topic, go to the Word of God. Amen? Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that we have a sure word. We thank you that we can study the word of God for ourselves, that it's accessible in so many forms. What a day that we can live in. What a privilege it is that we can read the Bible. Help us, Father, to read, to study, to meditate on your word, to study, to show ourselves approved unto God rightly dividing the word of truth. For we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.